In Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 7. Ecclesiastes 4 verse 7. The Bible says this, Then I returned and I saw vanity under the sun. There is one alone and there is not a second. Yea, he hath neither child nor brother, yet is there no end of all of his labor. Neither is his eye satisfied with riches, neither saith he, For whom do I labor and bereave my soul of good? This is also vanity, yea, it is a sore travail. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward of their, of their, I'm sorry, for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow, but woe unto him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat, but how shall one, or how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Let's pray this morning and we'll get started. Father, it is a, a blessing to be in your house today. Lord, thank you for all these folks that have made the diligent effort to come to church. Lord, I, I pray as we've already heard that we didn't come for some social agenda or some uh, thing that is carnal, but Lord, we've come to hear from you. Lord, we've come to hear from heaven. And Lord, I thank you for this message that's on my heart this morning. Lord, help me to get it out in a way that's pleasing to you. Lord, I pray you'd fill me with your words and with your power and put your spirit upon me that as this message goes forth, it fall upon receptive hearts. And Lord, I pray that you'll help this morning. Lord, help us to see the importance of what we're about to, to hear. And Lord, we do pray if there is one here this morning that doesn't know you as their personal Savior, they've never been born again into the child of, into the family of God and as a child of God, Lord, that you would help them to see that need this morning. Lord, thank you for loving us. Lord, we were unlovable when you loved us. And thank you for salvation. Pray now that you'll help us not to neglect it, but Lord, to be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving our own selves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Listen, this morning we're going we're gonna to talk about, um, or the, the title of this message I should say is this. It's not all about me. And I, listen, I promise you, I didn't, I didn't sit down with Brother Stephen last night. and All I told him was, you got Sunday school. And I didn't sit down with Brother O'Brien last night and say, here's what I want you to say during your presentation. The Lord's got this thought in my heart, it's not all about me. On the front of your bulletin, did you read that? Those words cut, don't they? Almost every sinful action ever committed can be traced back to a selfish motive. It is a trait we hate in other people, but justify in ourselves. Well, I just can't believe how selfish he is. Well, what, what did I do today that was selfish? I just can't believe how selfish that person was and what they, what they said, what they thought, what they did. Yeah, how about me? How about you? Well, we, we're real quick to strain the gnat and swallow a camel, aren't we? You've got to be careful. you got to be careful. Now, these verses dealing with the vanity in the first, uh, first two verses at least there, the, the vanity of isolation and the vanity of loneliness. It deals with the benefits of two, listen, and the strength of three. Amen. Hey, if two's good, three is better. <laughs> and four is even better, right? It keeps going. But two, the benefits of two. You know, you and I are, are created beings. Right? God created us. You believe that, don't you? God, God created you and I. And as, as created beings, you and I are social. We must have fellowship with someone in order to live healthy and happy lives. I would even say, because this, this study in Ecclesiastes we've titled, Living a Meaningful Life, I would even say this, for you and I to live a meaningful life, listen, we have to be able to fellowship one with another. We have to be able to converse and be social with other human beings. The Bible talks about unnatural affection. Say, so what is that? Talking to your dog. Hey, puppy, how are you? Oh, I got a cat. Hi, Bobcat, how are you this morning? How many of us have talked nicer to our pets than we've talked to a human being? Ouch. We're social beings. The way that we are programmed, if you will, the way that we are created and designed, we have to have some sort of interaction. If you were on a, an island all by yourself, and I don't recommend that you watch this movie, but if you had seen the movie Castaway, 
This is a man deserted on a, on a desert, on, on an ocean island, and there's no one else around, and so he finds a volleyball, and he puts a bloody handprint on the volleyball, and he calls the volleyball Wilson. Why? Because he's got to talk to somebody. You know, so many people in this life, they've got to talk to somebody, and you know who they don't go talk to? They don't go talk to God. They talk to everybody else, they talk to everything else, but they don't go to God. Look over at Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. The Bible here says it's, it's vain to be isolated. And look, there may be folks here that, that are lonely, that have those feelings of loneliness. Can I help you this morning? You're not alone. Especially if you're a born-again Christian, listen, it doesn't matter if nobody stands with you. As Paul said, the Lord stood with me. Somebody's there for you. I guarantee you, without even asking him, I haven't even asked him this question, but I guarantee you, Brother John in Ukraine from time to time has felt alone. I guarantee it. I remember talking to Brother Brent <laughs> over in Brashov. And all, you know, all those people around, yet you still, sometimes you feel alone. Can I be real honest with you? Pastor of this church now for almost two years. In a short year and a half, there's been times I've felt alone. But the Lord stood with me. He's right there. Listen, he's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. We're going to read that verse here in a minute. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. The Bible says this, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be what? <laughs> if God said it, is that good enough for you? God, look, God said it's not good for people to be alone. And he created a man and he said it's not good for that guy to be alone. So what did he do? He says, I will make him and help meet for him. Boy, that's a good study on those two words. Help meet. I know within the marriage structure that is, that is a blessing. Thing. Well, I, t- I appreciate my wife. <laughs> she is a tremendous help meet for me. But you know what it takes to get help? It takes humility. Come on. We live in southwest Virginia. We're by God, died in the wool, redneck Americans. Aren't we? I'm not. Okay, fine. Yeah, you are. (laughs) We are taught to be self-sufficient, are we not? My mother and my father raised me to, to take care of myself. I appreciate that. Thank you. We're raised to be that way. Especially guys. Hey, look, if something breaks and you ask somebody to fix it and you could have fixed it yourself, that's embarrassing, isn't it? It is. I had an issue with the parsonage. Something broke. My wife said, who are you going to call? So I'm going to fix it. <laughs> so is it working for now? <clears throat> but you know what it takes? Listen, 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 listen. You get to a point in your ministry, in your life, You're going to need some help. I know this man's pastor. I've read his letters. I can see his heart. Listen, what he did this morning took a lot of humility. He won't admit that because he's too proud to be humble. I'm kidding. It took a lot of humility. Listen, it takes a lot of humility to ask somebody for help. Now listen, we try to be self-sufficient, especially in this area. Take care of yourself. You take care of your neighbors. But you know what it's hard to do sometimes? It's hard to get on my knees and on my face before God and say, God, I need some help. And the vanity is we say, nope, I can handle this on my own. And the Lord sits back and says, okay, make a mess of it. And yet we could have gone to him and got all the help that we needed. But we're too stinking proud to do it. No, Lord, I'll I'll handle it. Okay. Okay. Help meet. The Lord is the ultimate help meet. How often are we going to him? Well, let's keep reading there. Verse 19, out of the ground of the Lord formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air. And he brought them uh, unto Adam to see what he would call them. Whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and the fowl of the air and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found an help meet for him. 
And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took the, uh, one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib, which the Lord God had taken from the man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And as they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Listen, what God did in the garden, he looked down and he saw, he saw a man that was alone. And God said, that's not good. It's not good the man should be alone. And there's a vanity in isolation. Listen, when, when problems come to mind in your life, listen, the response, the correct response is not to shut everyone else out, to stay at home from church, to shut the door, to turn on the TV, turn on the radio, and say, you know what, I'll figure it out on my own one day. That's not the right response. The right response is to get out, come to church, be a part of the family of God, help, tell your brothers and sisters, hey, I need some help. <laughs> Why? Because we're to bear one another's can't bear your burden if we don't know you got one. And look, we're, I'm, not, I'm not saying that to try to pry anybody's business. I'm just saying, look, if you've got a need, I promise you, as a pastor of church, I will pray for you and I will help you in every way I can. I hope that's evident. But you know what? I'm not alone. I've got, there's other brothers and sisters in this room this morning to help you. Here's another one. Knock on somebody's door, passing out tracks, and then being witnesses. Sir, man, can I tell you how you cannot go to hell? I think that's what I'm going to start saying. Say, would you like to go to heaven? Everybody's going to heaven. I guess nobody's going to hell. <laughs> can I tell you how not to go to hell? Oh, no, I'm good. No, I'll, I'll work it out on my own. Hey, listen, you can't do enough to keep yourself out of hell. Only God can do that. You need a help meet. <laughs> you need somebody to help you not go there. And Jesus provided the perfect way. He provided the gift, the perfect fulfilling sacrifice. It's all free to whosoever will receive that free gift. It's free. But people say, no, I'm good. I'm going to do it myself. And the Lord sits back and says, okay. Make a mess out of it. We see the vanity of, of isolation. You and I, as, as humans, we have desires to love and to be loved. We have desires to help and be helped. We have desires to accept, listen, and be accepted. Yet, as we've said, too many people look for these needs of life in all the wrong places. Turn, if you will, let's go to Proverbs 18. I told you we'd look at that verse here. Proverbs 18. And while we're turning there, I'll remind you of a verse that you know very well. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. The Bible says, But my God shall supply all of your what? According to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Boy, that verse, is get, that verse gets preached at every faith promise missions conference coming, and, conference coming and going. It gets preached all the time when we're talking about giving to the church or giving to needs. Have you ever thought about the needs that you have that are not financial? Does that verse not apply to those needs as well? Sure it does. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24, the Bible says, A man that hath friends must show himself what? I've said this a hundred times here. The friends that you have today, they're your friends because you showed yourself friendly to them. Somebody hates your guts and rather spit on you than talk to you, you're not going to be friends with that person. You might be friendly towards them if you've really got the Holy Spirit guiding you. But you won't be close friends. There's not close fellowship there. But for a man to have friends, he must show himself friendly. And let's finish the verse. There is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Now you think about what Jesus Christ has done for you and I. Listen, we were his enemies. We were the enemies of God in our sin. And yet, God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ did what? Is that not the most friendly gesture you've ever seen in your life? That somebody would, somebody would lay down their life on a cruel cross and be scourged and beaten and made fun of and spit upon and mocked for people who were doing it to him. And to hang there and say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. 
What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and what? All of our sins and griefs to bear. Do we trust Jesus for our salvation? Of course we do. Why do we not trust him with the trials and, and temptations of life? I can handle it on my own. No, you can't. I started the title of the message, You Can't Handle That. <laughs> it all works together. When tough times come, listen, God should be the first person we run to. First person. And listen, I, I know they're not here this morning. The grandparents are here. It thrills, it thrills, it thrills this pastor's heart. Watch a young couple go through a trial of a newborn baby that the mother didn't even get to hold until day two or day three. And yet watch them lean on the Lord. And still lean on the Lord. That's a blessing. That's a blessing. It's in the bulletin this morning, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And what's the promise? The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. I can't tell you how many times I've stood on that verse. Somebody calls, Pastor, this is going on. Immediately, as soon as the phone hangs up, I'm praying that verse. Lord, you said we could come to you. Lord, we need some peace, we need some help, we need some wisdom. Immediately. Peace is needed and can only come from God. It's the peace that passeth all understanding. Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. All those things are, are gifts of the Holy Spirit of God. God is the only answer, folks. He's the only one to run to in time of need and in time of help. He's the only one. Say, I'll just take care of it myself. You can't take care of it yourself. All right, back in Ecclesiastes 4. Ecclesiastes 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Verse 8, the Bible says this, There is one alone, and there is not a second. Now, this is talking about, he says, verse 7, I return and saw vanity under the sun. Now, remember, remember, remember the context of the, verse of Ecclesiastes, or the, or the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon has turned his heart away from God. He has allowed his wives that God said, don't multiply to yourself. He's allowed his gold and his silver and his horses. All those things God said, don't multiply that to yourself. He's done that, and every bit of it's turned his heart away from God, just as God told him it would. And so here's a man, he says, then I return. If you remember chapter 4, verse 1, he says, so I return. We talked about daydreaming a little bit, right? Running down those, those thought lines, and you get down here, and if your heart's turned away from God, you come to the conclusion it's not godly, it's not biblical. And that, getting back to verse 8, or verse 7, he says, I return. So we're coming back to reality here. <laughs> and I saw vanity under the sun. There is one alone, there is not a second. Yea, now watch this. Watch what your Bible says. He hath neither child nor brother. That's someone that's alone. Yet there is no end of all of his labor. Neither is his eye... What's the word? Do you see what that Bible's talking about? Your Bible's talking about somebody that's living only for themselves. It's all about me. It's not all about me. But that's what a selfish person says. It's all about me. What can I get? How can I be benefited? How can I be profited? What's in it for me? And here's a man that... He's alone, he's working all day, all night, and he says, and the Bible says, his eye is not satisfied with riches. Neither saith he, for whom do I labor and bereave my soul for good? In other words, this guy is working, he's getting all he can get, he's getting all he can get, and guess what? He's not happy. He's not content, he's not satisfied. So you know what that tells me? 
for your life and for my life to have meaning, for our life to be enjoyable, for our life to be full of joy, not only now on this earth, but one day for all of eternity, for us to be in that position, our life has to be about others. Did Jesus not say it's more blessed to give than to receive? He said that, did he not? Did Jesus not come down from heaven, manifested in the flesh, God manifested in the flesh, and walk this earth for 33 and a half years and concern himself with others? That's exactly what he did. Now, how about you and I? Am I consuming all the blessings, all the resources that God has blessed me with? Is it all about me or is it about somebody else? Now, there's a balance there. Okay, before you get over in the left side ditch, there's a balance there. But if we can't point to some places in our life and say, you know what, I'm doing this for somebody else. I'm doing this for the glory of God. I'm doing this for the furtherance of the gospel. If we can't get to that place in our life, we can't name and identify those things going on in our life. Listen, our life is all about ourselves. And it's vain. It's a vexation. There's no... Happiness there. Lasting happiness. Oh, there's pleasure in sin for a season. A meaningful life consists not in what I can get, but rather what I can give. I know he was a, a wicked man, but you know, John F. Kennedy had a great quote in his inauguration speech. He said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. That generation's gone. Now, church member, ask not what your church can do for you. What can you do for your church? Now, born again Christian, listen, ask not what can God do for me. What can I do for God? Those are sobering questions. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a what? Holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. God has done so much for us. It's reasonable for us to turn around and give it all back to him. Because guess what? We don't have anything without him. Oh, preacher, I got all this. I worked so hard for that money. Who blessed you with that money? God blessed you with that money. Oh, preacher, I worked so hard to get this house. Who blessed you with that house? Look, all blessings come from God. Who are we to think that we can consume them upon our own lusts? Selfishness. 1 Corinthians 7, 23 and chapter 6, verse 20, both of those tell us that we are bought with a price. Therefore, chapter 7, be not the servants of men, in chapter 6, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are His. Hey, God, he, does, he doesn't expect that, but He deserves that, does He not? Sure He does. It's not unreasonable to ask that. 2 Corinthians 12, turn over there. Turn over there. I, I preached this back last mission's revival, but we hadn't touched it really since then, so let's read it again this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Second Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 15, just to remind us of the heart of the Apostle Paul. You remember the Corinthian church. You remember the problems in the Corinthian church. There was fornication. There was incest. There were people taking each other to court. They were suing within the church body. That is not unity. That is the actual picture of of disunity or disjunction or a schism in the body. That's the picture of the Corinthian church. And the first letter from the Holy Ghost goes to them and it, repro it reproves them and rebukes them and instructs them in righteousness. And the second letter goes to them and says, this is how your manner of living ought to be. And the words are penned, chapter 12, verse 15, I will very gladly spend and be spent for me. Is that what your Bible says? No, but that's the attitude of many of us, is it not? I'll do everything I can for me. I'll do everything I can to make sure I'm okay. 
I'll do everything I can to benefit me. But what about somebody else? The Bible says, I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. <laughs> you give somebody a gift, what do you expect? At a minimum, you expect a thank you, right? And if you do something for somebody, you try to be a blessing to them, and you, you, you give them a gift, or you go do a, a, a job for them, whatever it is, and, and they just come look at it and turn around and walk away and don't say thank you, what do you think of that person? How dare they? Stuck up, <laughs> right? That's what we think. But yet, the words of God here says, I'll very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. You know what the mark of a mature Christian is? Is to do something for someone else, and they listen, they turn around and hate you for it, and you say, you know what, I still love that person. That's the mark of a mature Christian. To be able to take reproach and be reproved for the name of God and be hated because you're a Christian and yet in turn still love that person. You say, I don't believe that happens. Is that not what Jesus did? That's exactly what Jesus did. And we ought to follow his example. I'll very gladly spend to be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I'll be loved. Back to Ecclesiastes 4. How much are we willing to pour ourselves into the lives of others that they might hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, that they might be saved? How much are we willing to pour our lives into the lives of others that they might be discipled and they might be taught the Bible, and they might learn to, to grow and, and love Jesus Christ. Listen, not because we tell them they ought to, but because they see our lives and see the joy in our hearts and say, you know what, I want that. <laughs> How much, are we willing to do that? Or do we just want to sit back and say, you know, I'm tired. Worked all week. Ecclesiastes 4, verse 9. The Bible says two are better than one. Now, these next couple of verses here, I'm going to show you the benefits of others, but especially the benefits of the brethren. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. A good reward for their labor. You ever, you ever done a job with one of your brethren here at church? Whether it be mowing the yard out front or whether it be going on a missions trip. Yeah, I remember going to, to Romania with a few of the guys in here and, and building that, that Sunday school edition there for Brother Brent. Well, we we just sit down and we can talk about that. There's good fellowship about that. Some of you all have been to Papua New Guinea. And I, I love to hear you talk about hiking up and down those ridiculous trails over there and throwing up and going to Mexico and working for God down there and eating pig's eyes and whatever else you ate down there. I love hearing those stories. You know what laboring for God together does? It builds a camaraderie. Well, I tell you what, it, 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 every Sunday that we go out and knock on doors, that gets built a little bit more with whoever your partner is. And one day you sit down and you'll say, you remember that time we knocked on that door? You remember, remember, remember that person came to church? Well, look at him now. Well, wouldn't that be a blessing? You remember, you remember uh, that guy called you and, and said he needed to talk about the Lord and, and you went and, and I went with you and we sat down and we opened the Bible and we, that guy got led to the Lord. He accepted Jesus as a Savior. Man, he came to church. He got, I mean, he got in, man. He got baptized. He got discipled. Man, that, they're going to Ghana, West Africa now as missionaries. Wouldn't that be good? How are we going to get that? We're going to have to work together. Oh, no, I've got my ministry. I'll just take care of my ministry. It's not going to cut it. <clears throat> Bible says in Philippians 127, it says that we are to strive together for the faith of the gospel. Striving together. Listen, folks, I appreciate everybody taking up the charge to hang door hangers. A thousand door hangers are going to go out. 
How does that happen? Not by one person doing it, by everybody working together. Why? Because two are better than one. And did not our Lord send them out two and two? <laughs> There's a reason for that. <clears throat> Verse 10, for if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Just, to, just as an example, use my grandmother. There last week, she, she fell out weeding around the carport and uh, broke her wrist, maybe you know that. And uh, she ended up sitting there for about an hour, hour and 15 minutes before somebody came by to help her. Well, that's the practical of that verse. But how about spiritually? How about spiritually when we get hurt and we get wounded? You know who's there to lift you up? Your brethren. You know who's there to help you? The brethren. There's comfort. There's burden bearing. There's warm hearts. Verse 12, it says, or verse 11, again, if two lie together and they have, then they have heat, but how can one be warm alone? In verse 12, if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Threefold cord. There's strength to stand, benefits of, of others, especially the brethren. There's strength to stand, there's strength to fight. Verse 13 says a threefold cord is not quickly broken. I think this is best illustrated in the marriage relationship. You have a husband and you have a wife and there's strength there. The Bible says a threefold cord is not quickly broken. You know who the third party is? If God's the third party, that's a strong union. And that's not quickly broken. But I'm talking about social relationships. You think about your friends. The relationships that you have with them. Now listen, is that relationship centered on God? If it is, that's going to be a strong bond. If it's not, you may lose that friend one day. Whatever relationship it is, if God's the center of it, there's strength there, there's solidarity there. So this morning we've seen isolation and loneliness is vain. Two are good, but three's better. Three's better. Let's pray this morning. Lord, we love you.